Hello there, my mate Vince here and another episode in the series of buying up eBay junk and trying to make profit. So I bought this big box of items for £40 plus £7 postage. I'm going to work through them one by one and hopefully we might be able to get some repairs out of them. Will you be able to make your money back? Will you make a fortune from them or will they all be broken beyond repair and will I make a loss? It should be quite interesting to find out. So let's get started right away on it. They all look like they're Argos products, I think, because they've all got these return labels on them and their bush argos is like a catalog shop here in the uk i'm hoping these haven't been looked at which would be nice so there might be some straightforward fixes in there let's get started straight away on the first one first up we have a bush alarm clock radio and it says at the back here volume doesn't work refund so uh, yeah awesome we must have got a refund on this one it's nice that we got the boxes with them and the uh item itself to me Looks new. Right, it turns on. Right, so volume up is not working, but volume down is. Interesting. Okay, right, let's check out the volume button. Nice and straightforward, we just have screws round the back. It's got batteries as well. I don't know if that's for battery backup, if the mains goes or whether it actually runs off that. It's probably for backup. So you don't have to keep resetting the uh, setting the time again if you have a power cut. Right, so we need to get to this board here. Oh, look at that. It's got a little uh, linear power supply there. Oh, I thought it'd be a switch mode power supply. That's kind of nice. Right now, volume up is this one here. Well, immediately I can't see anything wrong with it. I wonder, is it dirty underneath? Might be a little bit of corrosion or something. Oh, could it be a bad solder joint? Looks to be okay. Let's peel off the sticker here. Well, I can't see anything wrong with that whatsoever. Looks perfectly clean and completely new. I wonder is this not pushing down properly? In here. You know what I mean? If that plastic was a bit shorter than the others, I wonder would that make the difference? Let's uh, see what I'm going to do. I'm going to swap them over just in case it's a combination of that plastic being ever so slightly short, you know, just like a fraction of a millimetre shorter, and this being a fraction of a millimetre not as domed as this one. So let me swap it with the one next to it and see if the fault follows it or not. If it doesn't follow it, it might suggest that the plastic here is at fault. If it does follow it, it will suggest that this little thing here is at fault. But they are clicking and it does look clean. So there's no point in cleaning that with IPA, it looks immaculate, it looks brand new. All right, so I'm sticking that back down again. Still clicking. I'm gonna add a little bit more tape to that there because now that I've unpeeled it, it might not be as sticky as it was before. Just add a bit of Captain tape to it. Right, let's put it back together. Well, I've just got one screw in for the time being. I'm just going to plug it in and see if it's behaving any differently. Yay! Isn't that weird? So, unless it was slightly misaligned, or maybe the tolerances 
It goes quite loud. Yeah, I'm only just tapping that and it's working. Uh, yeah, maybe the tolerances were just slightly, uh, slightly different. No, it's quite straightforward to use. Yeah, there we go. Right, okay. I can uh, clean that up later on, but it was all looking relatively new and clean anyway. So to begin with, that is a success. The first one fixed. Let's move on to the next one. Right, so that's the screws back in. What I would say is that uh, obviously that's just a very quick test. I'm only going by what it says here. There might be numerous other things wrong with it that I don't know, but there's a lot to get through. So let's just go by what the sticker says and hope that the original customer did report the correct problem. Next up, it looks like we've got another LED alarm clock radio and it says faulty no sound and it says here alarm not making a sound. Lovely neat writing. Refund. So let me just verify that. Again, it looks like a new product. Right, as far as I can see, it's not the alarm side of things. I think it's just the speaker in general. Because right now, look, I'm on a, you know, I'm on a band here, and if I, as that dims it, if I move, how do I change the bands? There we go. So if I move this here. You can hear it's not making any hiss noise and I've got volume right up. So I think it's an actual speaker problem rather than just the alarm not going off. Let's take it apart and see if we can see what's going on. Maybe the speaker's not plugged in. Maybe the audio amplifier chip's not working. Right, where would the speaker be? So the speaker's going to be here. So, well there we go, look. There's no wires attached to it there. Have a look. What's going on? And this is the other side, but there's no wires attached there. How bizarre. That's really, really weird. You'd expect maybe one wire to have fallen off, not both of them. Because it doesn't look like these have been tampered with. How strange. In fact, look here, these are the wires from here. What's going on? These must be the wires here. Really, really odd. Right, so, oh, the aerial's disconnected as well. What? Right, let's see what's happening here. So that's from the batteries. So it's been taken, it must be this one here. How strange is that? Right, so are they going to be speakers there? Where do they go to? Let's have to zoom in and have a look. So I presume they're here. It looks like, oh no, sorry, this one here. I mean, it looks like we've got the points here for it. So it was there at some stage. Where does it go to? So this is going to be a ground and this one goes through that resistor. Is it through the diode maybe? Is it working its way up into this chip? So I would say that is going to be speaker. And this one here must be the aerial, but why have we got this one here as well? Or are these supposed to be? No, there's three wires here. What's going on? Hold on a minute. So, slightly confused. We have the battery connector going in there. We have the power supply going from the back here through that linear transformer again into the board here. So we've definitely got power going in. This is feeding the top board here. And they are the connections for the speaker. And I can see a little bit remains of a black wire, red wire there. But yet there's nothing in the back here. Okay. Right, what we'll have to do is the aerial. I'm not sure where I should connect the aerial to, if I'm honest with you. See, I'm thinking that's speakers, but I don't actually know. Just wondering why we've got three contacts over here. Well, look, this one looks like it's come off from there. It looks like it's been cut on purpose. Let's solder that one onto there. Let's not worry about these two just yet. See, I'm wondering if they're to do with the speakers here, and maybe this is a different model. 
Oh, here we go. Here we go. So we have, uh, it's, it's labeled at the back here, ground, antenna AM, antenna FM. So surely that, yeah, this is gonna be FM. So this won't have, I don't think this will have AM. I don't know that, but where would it go to? And how's it, uh, how's it grounding? Because this is just a single wire. Well, I think what I'll do is I'll just solder that on, put the speakers to here and see what's going on. Now, obviously I haven't got one of those little connectors, so I'm just gonna solder two wires from here straight onto the speakers. Luckily, I can see that that's the red one there, but I don't think it really makes a difference. It's just gonna be going in when it should be going out and vice versa. But I put the ground to the black one on the left side, and because I can see a bit of red wire, I put that one to the right one, which is going into the chip. Right, there's only one wire here, so I'm gonna solder that on to the bottom one here. So I re-solder up the little FM wire, and then I solder up two wires going to the speaker. The color-coded wires that I have are all a little bit too thin. I wanna put something in a little bit thicker than that. So I'm using slightly thicker wire and I'm just putting a little bit of red heat shrink on it just to denote which one is the positive. And then the other one is black anyway, so that's gonna be the negative. Oh, hold on a minute, here we go. These are the other two connections, aren't they? The coil here. Well, I presume, yeah, they, they must be the AM side of things. How am I gonna know which one is ground and not? Maybe it doesn't matter because it's just a coil of wire. So that must be the AM uh, thing. Yeah, that must be some kind of ferrite something that the wires are wrapped around. Okay, well, that's mystery solved. How this happened, I really don't know. It's so, so bizarre here. Obviously, somebody's taken a look at it, and uh, I, I just don't understand why there's nothing left. Why would you just cut wires and pull out wires? How's that going to fix anything? It'd be different if all the wires were taken out of it to fix up another one. This here just makes no sense. Anyway, we'll put it back together how we think it should be, and then we'll see if it's going to work. These little AM wires here look like they're covered in a, a little bit of fabric, so uh, I'm just melting off each end of it by just using a bit of solder. And I suppose the solder's so hot, it's just melting away the fabric. And then I just solder it into place. And then we can uh, put the lid back on it. I won't do up any screws and we'll see if it's working. Right, so you can see now that they're not gonna short together because once that goes fully hard, then there's glue in between them. So it can't crush anymore. And that's the speakers, wire there, wire there going down to there. There's already hot glue on it from the manufacturer anyway, so I don't feel bad using hot glue. It doesn't bother me at all because if you need to get into it again, a little bit of IPA makes it so easy to take off. So, uh, yeah. Right, let's pop this on. Now let's see if it's doing what it needs to do. I won't put the screws in just yet. Let's see if we now have sound. No. What's going on? Right, I suppose we need to eliminate the speaker. So let's unsolder this. Actually, no, I'll leave it on for a moment. Let me get my speaker with uh, a probe on it and uh, I'll go across and see if we can get any sound coming out of it. Right, so I've got my Bluetooth speaker here. So what it will allow me to do is it will allow me to probe the ports here and uh, also work my way along. Now, I've had a little check. So basically, that transformer is gonna be AC to AC at a lower voltage. So if you have a look here, it comes up on the white connections. Can you see this is a bridge rectifier to turn it into DC? And if I go across here, it's coming up as uh, eight volts. So I feel safe working on the board, but remember it's 240 volts at the bottom of that transformer, so I'm not gonna go anywhere near the transformer. And then it must go to, through here, it must come out DC. I presume this is a voltage regulator. Let's see if we've got any voltage on this. Five volts, so it must be coming out on five volts and then going into it. So let's zoom right in. What I'm gonna be doing is, well, first of all, 
This is my lead here. So we have left and right audio and ground. I'm not bothered about whether it's left or right. I just want one of the channels and ground. So I've unsoldered the, uh, the wires going off to the speaker. Let's go to bands. Turn it on. Bands, that should be AM. So we should be getting some sort of noise. Obviously I'm keeping my hands well away from there. That could kill me if I put my fingers in there. Right, that doesn't sound like any sort of fuzz. Let's put the volume right up. Let's go to FM. And again, there's no fuzz. So this board is not generating a sound. I think it's gonna be that uh, sound chip here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the ground from here, or I can use a negative from the capacitors, because, well, I think I can. I'm not sure if it's gonna be separate from the ground here. But, uh, this wire's come out here now, but that's only for the battery, so that won't make a difference. I mean, I'm just thinking it wouldn't be the same connection for both of them, surely. Surely, what does it say on it what it is? Let me get the IPA. I'm just going to unplug this a minute. I want to get the IPA, I just want to make sure, because if somebody's been in here messing, maybe that connection was in here. So let's take off this little snot of glue. And let's see what it says underneath it. And we can do this one here. Speaker. <laughs> yes. Look at that, it says speaker. They've plugged it in wrong. Look. Speaker. There, so the speaker goes into this one. So this one here, because look, that's going off to the battery pack here. Right, well, let's unplug that. That must go in here. Let's have a look underneath this one and see what it says. Results. Negative and positive. There we go. Negative and positive. So let's plug that in. In fact, that's the wrong way round, isn't it? Look. This is labelled negative and positive here, and when we plug this in here, it's going to be positive and negative. Hmm, interesting. I wonder, does it make a difference? I mean, they wouldn't have got that wrong, would they? Anyway, right, so the speaker is this one here. So now, let's wire up. Well, I'll tell you what, let's plug it in and let's see our little test on our own speaker here. Let's see if we get sound out of it. And then we'll plug in the plug on, plug the wires in, you know, solder the wires on. Result, I'm glad I checked that. Right, power. So we should have something now. Is this still on? I think so. Let's see if we have anything. Yay! Fantastic. Let's put the volume up. So we're at 16 now. It. So what I was going to do anyway, I was, I was going to take the ground from here and probe along the track. Then, for example, if it worked here and it didn't work here, if it worked this side of the inductor and not that side of the inductor, then you know the inductors fail. So it's a nice easy way to sort of probe around the place just with a separate little powered speaker. Remember, the amplifier is built into this. Right, okay. Unplug. Let's get the soldering iron on and solder this up to here. How weird is that? So now let's zoom in and see if we can work out what's negative. So I'm on continuity. And it's these ones here. So this must be the audio chip here, I presume. Now let me go on to the negative of the capacitors. So the stripe is there, so this one here is a negative. Let's see if that will tell me which is a negative over here. No, it won't. No, they must be separate. Uh, let me go on to that capacitor. No, okay. Right, this is an 8002A. Right, okay, it says here that VO1 is the negative output and VO2 is the positive output. So let's concentrate on the positive one, the one with the red. So we want to put this one to VO2 because remember, the speaker originally had a little bit of red wire coming out here. Positive, pin eight, pin eight. Okay, so we want a positive to be top right. Meter and continuity. Top right. 
is the left hand one. Yeah, and then the other one was here, which is the right hand one. So positive is going to the left hand one. I don't think it would have made any difference. So that's the great thing about being able to get the pinouts for the chip. We now know that the pinout has told us that the positive is on number eight and number eight goes to the left hand pad. So I'm just soldering up both wires. We'll put the lid back on. Let's see now if it's going to work. Right, let's plug it in and see what it's doing. So we've got the time, which we can, uh, how do we set the time? Set, oh, here we go. Hour, minutes, uh, buzz, PM, and now band. Set, power on, there we go. There we go. Okay. I know it obviously reception's bad, but that's just my house. Now, let's see if we can get anything here. Better be careful of a copyright strike. There. Fantastic. So there we go. And that's dim and light. Right, and for those of you that are curious, I put batteries in the back of this and I just set the time to 2.03, I think it was, and it was a couple of minutes ago now. The display's off, so obviously it doesn't power the display. It must be purely to keep the uh, crystal, you know, the, the, the clock moving. Yeah, there you go, 2.06. Fantastic. So even though the plus and the negative looked like they were swapped because the red was negative and the black was positive, obviously it isn't actually swapped. Right, let's move on to the next one. Right, next up we have this little radio here. Put batteries in the back here, go to turn it on, nothing's happening. And if I put the power supply in, I'll just take one of these out just in case it comes back through to here with the fault. This is 5.9, one amp, centre pin positive. If I plug it in here, bench power supply, still nothing is happening. And the sticker just says on it, Faulty doesn't work. So let's take it apart and see what is going on. I suppose what we'll do is let's pop the batteries in it. Right, let's see if we have power going through. So yeah, they go 5.4 volts. Right, so is it something to do with the power button? Let's take out this top board here. Right, power, power, power. Which one is power? So it's this one here. This is the power one here. So let's see, first of all, if the switch is working. Go to continuity. Normally these are diagonals. And the switch is working. Interesting. Right now, so we've got from here, it goes onto the board here. Let's have a look at this board here. Now, it looks like there's a burn patch just here, doesn't it? Can you see here? There's like a brown patch underneath this uh, IC here. So, I wonder, let's have a close look. Also, that looks burnt through there. Let's have a look. Right, how does that look? Is that a burn mark in the middle of that? And the other thing I want to look at is that one there. Let's zoom right the way in. Right, there you go. That's burnt, hasn't it? Can you see the board is all charred here? So I reckon that may be a voltage regulator. Also, is this okay? No, that's gone as well. But is that the same chip, 88? Is that 8802? I'm just gonna take a picture of that and then I'll scrape it, see if that's a burn mark in the middle of it. Right, so I've taken a picture of it now so I can zoom in and read that even if I do scrape it. And I'm just gonna take a picture of that other component as well, but I think this one's too far gone. Yeah, look at that crack in there. Look at that, huge. Right, so I think this has got two chips gone on it. So luckily by using our eyes, we can see that there's two chips with massive burn marks on them. One's particularly bad. Luckily though, the audio chip is only a tiny little hole. So I can actually still make out the markings on it, which is fantastic because it means we can replace it like for like, which is always what you really would like to do. 
Amazingly, I already have, I think, eight of these in my spare parts because I think I bought them when I did up some John Lewis radios two or three years ago, or they might have been the blah punked ones. I've probably pronounced that wrong. I learned it at the time, but I've forgotten it again. They're the ones that used to make good car radios. So I can replace that, no problem. But the actual other one I'm thinking is a voltage regulator, but I don't know. The markings are completely gone from it. I've written down a couple of markings that I think are on it, but nothing's coming up on Google because there's a massive crater in the middle of it. So I don't actually know what this one is, so it's going to be a bit of guesswork. So where I'm picking up the video is where I've taken off the audio amplifier chip and I've taken off the remains of the voltage regulator and I want to try to work out what the pads are on the voltage regulator. Not interested in the audio chip because we know we can change that no problem, the pads are perfect. So the ground on the voltage regulator is the middle pin on the left hand side but I don't know what any of the other pins are. So let's pick up the video and try to work out what those pins are doing. Right, so we've got voltage from the batteries going into the board. Let's see whether we have anything. We know that this bottom one is ground, so let's see if we've got anything going in. So right now, I'm going between uh, this one. Oh, sorry, no, it's the middle one that's ground, yeah. So that side of the capacitor. So I'm going between this one now and this one here. Let's see if we've got any voltage. Yeah, 4.7 volts. Okay, have we got anything going on the output? I reckon that that's going to be a 3.3 volt regulator. What do you think? Problem is I'm not going to know what it is. So I'm just replacing the audio IC. This only had a pinhole burn on it, so it's easy to read. So I can replace it with certainty, knowing that I'm doing like for like, so the board is going to work as intended. What's really annoying is, though, that little 5-pin IC, the really badly burnt one with the crater in the middle, how do I know what that is? You know, I'm guessing it's a 5 volt to 3.3 volt regulator, but even in my stash here, I must have about 10 of them. And I only bought a little selection of voltage regulators. Worldwide, there's probably hundreds, if not thousands, of 5 volt to 3.3 voltage, reg volt voltage regulators. In which case, then, how on earth are you supposed to know what it is without schematics? Now, I understand why some companies won't have schematics. Like a company could go bust, and so the schematics are not going to exist in years to come. Or, let's say if it was a smaller company, what, do they really have to get a website available to give schematics to, you know, the tiny percentage of people that are going to fix the products worldwide? Also, are they going to have phone support? for you to ring them up and ask them for schematics. I think it'd be just much better, obviously schematics would be the best, but how good would it be if everything was labelled up on the board? So with this board here, you see like R29, C29, L8, it gives you an idea, but it's just marking out the components. Unless it's written on the resistor or the capacitor, you're not going to know what those components actually are. Some boards actually have the values written on the components uh, on the board and I think that's much better so for example when it comes to chips you could just take off the chip and see what it says underneath and then you know what it is now obviously if the boards burn fair play you're not going to be able to know what it is but if it was heavily populated you might not be have room to put the markings on but there's loads of empty space on boards even brand new boards from like Nintendo switches and stuff there's still spaces like on the edges where they're massive ground planes that you'd be able to get loads of printing on there and it could just be like U1 you know the chip could be labeled up U1 another one could be labeled up U2 and then it would be U1 equals or you know on an empty ground plane U1 equals 8002 U2 equals and you could just have the markings on the chip that way and that way even if the chips blow up it doesn't matter because you know you've got the markings on the board now i appreciate revisions and stuff would happen but if revisions are happening then the chances are the boards well i suppose the chips could be different but i would say normally when revisions happen the boards are probably slightly redesigned anyway to fit different chips so in which case then how much more work would it be to put the silk screen on the boards i think it would be a lot cheaper than having to have the schematics available to everybody for years and years to come if the markings were on the board, even in 50 years' time, this thing could still be fixed if the chips still exist because you know, with even without schematics, what the chips are. So yeah, that's my uh, two pennies worth on that. Uh, but anyway, we've got the chip in now. What I want to do is I want to put voltage in from a bench power supply to see if we can get this thing livened up. And then at least I know which is the input voltage, which is the ground, and then which is the output voltage. That might help me being able to decide which correct 5-pin IC voltage regulator to put in here. 
Apologies for the way I sound, my nose is completely blocked due to hay fever, and every time I take tablets, I just can't stay awake. So, uh, yeah, Philips Air Purifier doesn't seem to be making my hay fever any better, because the problem is I can't have a Philips Air Purifier when I walk outside, when I open up the back door, when I open up a window. So, uh, yeah, my hay fever is just as bad this year as it is every other year, annoyingly. Right, first of all, let's see, we've got our batteries in. Let's see if it's going to come to life. Turn on power here. Anything? No. Right, okay. Now, let's put in, I'm gonna to have to solder a little wire onto here. Right, I'm gonna solder onto this one here because this leg just goes through like resistors and a capacitor or inductor, so maybe it's getting some sort of feedback. Let's just solder onto here and then see if it will work on the, uh... yeah, let's just see if it comes to life on 3.3 volts. I hope I don't blow it up. Let's get a ground soldered in from a negative of a capacitor. Right, so that leg there, let's do this one. Let's just make sure that that ground is the same as the ground over here. So I'm on here. Is it going to beep on this one here? Yes, it is. Right, so we're going to put this to our negative off the bench power supply. We're now going to put the positive in here. It might go bang. Let me give it power here. Right, so I'm going in now. 3.3 volts, it's drawing 0.4, there we go, here we go, look at this, excellent, look at that. Would it turn off? I suppose it won't turn off because we're putting power into it. Yes, yeah, so it was kind of ignored, oh, here we go, FM, DAB, oh, so it's changing the mode, I wonder how you turn it off though. Because we can't turn it off because you see I've just got the power going straight in. Right, so this is good. We've already put the audio chip in. We know that is going to be the same. And we've now proved that it works on 3.3 volts out. So I'm going to have a look through all my spares and see if I have any 5 pin regulators, voltage regulators, that are 5 volts on the input or you know, maybe up to 6 volts on the input and 3.3 volts on the output. And then if I can get the pin out for the ones that I have as spares, you never know if I can marry up grounds, the output on the top right hand side and then the input on the top left hand side, that's three pins out of the five, I might be able to get one that works. Right, I've got lots to choose from here. Loads of these are 3.3 volt regulators. I got them all from CPC a long time ago, but a lot of them are just single ones. So obviously if I use them, I'd need to order up more for the future. Uh, they're all five pin, which is good. It's just that I haven't got a clue the difference between them. And remember, I don't know if there's gonna be, you know, there's five things there, isn't there? So on a voltage regulator, you would have ground, you would have the input and you would have the output, that's three pins. What do the other pins do? I presume it's some kind of feedback to monitor and then it can adjust the input volt, uh, the output voltage depending on what, it can, sorry, it can adjust the input voltage depending on what the output voltage is doing. But I, you know, it's, it's way, way, way beyond me. But I'm gonna have a look at them and all I'm gonna do is see if any of these marry up with the output, the input and the ground. And if they do, fingers crossed, it might do the same job. Right, I've been looking through them. These two are definitely not suitable because the pinout's completely different. But I've got a whole range of them here that looks like they would be suitable. But I think I'm gonna go for this one to begin with purely because I've got so many off them and I don't really know the difference between them, but I'm gonna show you that now. It's from CPC, that is the order, the, uh, the part number there. Yeah, but that's just like a CPC internal part number, but it brings up the data sheet when you go into their website. Anyway, remember R1 was voltage in here, ground here. This wasn't going anywhere, it was just connected through to here. And then when I put 3.3 volts on the output, it started to work. Remember, I couldn't turn it on or off, and I don't know what that one does. But anyway, if you look here, so I've got 10 of these here. So that's the reason I'm going with these to start with, because I've got loads of them. 
And it's this thing here. Now I don't know how many milliamps it should be, I really don't know, but looking at the pinout, can you see that uh, we've got voltage in here, which is correct, we've got ground here, we've got this thing here, which is, uh, I don't know, I'm going to show you that in a minute, voltage out here and bypass, and if I go down, let's just see what SHDN is. Oh sorry, it does say that it should be, uh, if I go to the actual CPC website, you see here that it says, 2.7 volts to 6 volts input, so ours is covered in that because we've got 4 point something on the batteries all the way up to 5.6 or something on the power supply uh, and 3.3 volts out, but it is only 100 milliamps, but maybe that's going to be enough. It looks to be about the same size. Let's find out what this SHDN actually means. Right, oh, here we go. Remember I said I couldn't shut it down. SHDN means shutdown control input. The regulator is fully enabled when a logic high is applied to the input. So I presume that means voltage. The regulator enters shutdown when a logic low is applied to this input. During shutdown, output voltage falls to zero. The supply current is reduced to 0.5 microamps. Hmm. Do you know what? Let's give it a go. And maybe then it will shut down as well because that pin will recognize that there's no voltage getting to it when you press power and it might put that chip into shutdown. Let's give it a go, can only be wrong. So while I'm soldering in the voltage regulator, we'll give a shout out to the My Mate Vince Massive. Members this month are kidsdigital.com, Kip Hakes and Max Rokotansky. Having fun repairs? Chris Seal, Felipe at mrkeebs.com, DJVG, Pigsy, Robert from Timsey's Auto Air, Daniel Watson, Zeke's C, Anthony Dean, Bazza2, Russ Melanson, Ellis Garbutt, Gaspar Heller, Richard Berglund, Jacob Culpin, Matt Rawlins, and Soul Reaver 555. Right, and that's the underside of it done as well, so it's got no chance of knocking down and shorting on those other pins. Realistically, it probably would have been just easier to run a little uh, enameled wire underneath the board there and put some solder mask on it. Right, you're probably completely lost here, it's because I've got three hours of footage that I'm trying to break down, so bits have to be cut. I've run a wire between the two pins on the chip because there was a track originally going between these two pins, but the track has been long since burnt off. So rather than trying to run the wire on the track, I've just decided to do a disgusting looking arch on top. And I've put liquid tape on it to stop any chance of it bending or, you know, like if it got dropped or something off any of it, then touching any of the other pins. So I've just covered it in liquid tape because that will insulate it. So that's the reason why you've got this funny looking arch on it. Anyway, if it works, it works. Whether it's an arch or a track, it does the same job. It connects two parts of this chip together. Internally, this chip is not connected on those two pins. It was the board that made the chip connected on those two pins. It's on. Let's now give it a test to see if it's finally working. Right now, nothing on here at the moment. Let's go to turn it on. No. No, you're not working. So I check for voltage on the output and it's incredibly low. So what I'm now gonna do is go back to CPC and I'm gonna look at another one and put that chip in and see if we have more luck with that one. So this is the one I've decided to try next because some of them had enable on that pin. You know that one that had the shutdown thing? Some of them was called enable. So you see maybe I need to enable the chip more than have some fancy shutdown when maybe another part of this board deals with the shutdown. Right, this is the next one that I'm gonna try. Unfortunately, I've only got one of these and you can see there that it is a 3.3 volt output again. And if I go to the data sheet, that's what it is, LDO regulator, 300 milliamps, that's higher. High PSRR, I don't know what that means. And if you have a look here at the pinout, that one says enable. So in, ground, enable, out, and not connected, which is weird because R1 is connected, but still, I'll do it and see what happens. Right, so that's that one soldered in there now. Haven't cleaned it up with any IPA or anything. Let's see if this is gonna work. I'm wondering now whether the output, the feedback needs to be on this one here. 
So it's outputting here and it's feeding back through here, telling this what to do, rather than being on here. But none of the ones I've got are feeding back on that one. There it goes. Anything? Oh, yes, come on. Come on now. Right, okay, that's that. Is menu working? Yes. Okay, and uh, FM. So is there any sound? Oh, we haven't got the speaker plugged in, right. And it turns off, that's promising. Whether it's really turning off or not, maybe part of the circuit's still alive that I'm not gonna know about, so maybe the batteries will drain. But it's certainly doing more than when I uh, started. Here goes. Result, right, I am gonna now turn it off. How do you turn it off? There, off. Now let's see if it's working from the bench power supply. Oh, time is not set, look. Let's do it. Oh, maybe it's, it's gonna pick up a signal, excellent. Right, one second, did that just come on automatically when I plugged that in? Maybe we can't turn it off from when it's plugged into there. Let's see if we can. Stand by, we can. Oh, no, we can't, hold on. Oh, no, hold on a minute. That's probably right. It probably always comes up with the time when it's off, when it's on bench power supply. It's only when it's uh, connected to the batteries that you would want it off completely. So let's see, hold it down. Stand by. Now it will go to the time, yeah. But now if we were to unplug that, I think it's designed to do that and now turn it on. That's clever. So on the batteries, it will turn itself off completely. Hmm, yeah, I think that is correct. Right, I am going to put it back together and then bring it outside and see if we can get any reception on it. Check this out, I just had to hold not, down, not, not I think it was menu, and then it gave me the opportunity to do a full say, scan, no, and now this is the ABA radio. It's, it's an easy, easy meat, meat. Uh, it requires a bit of chewing, yeah. has a huge Result, look, check flavor. it out, I'll go it to uh, Times, Talk Sport, and go to Select. In more need of being moved on than Jane Sancho is. How good is that? And if I go to here, this will bring me over to FM. There we go, got a change away from that. Results it appears to be working. Like the sure. And now, if and I do this, he does do it will turn it off. Now, I just want to bring it inside. And now that I've done the DAB scan, I wonder will it come up with the correct time when we plug it into the power supply? Yes, it has straight away. There you go, half past eight, and it is half past eight, and it is the 23rd. 23rd of the 6th. How good is that on DAB? Do you know, somebody told me that they don't do that in other countries, but in the UK it comes up with the time and also the date as well. Do you know what? I'm really very happy with that indeed. So let's see now, yeah, connecting. Style is Fantastic, so and it's picking up the section inside now as well. To be because it looks a bit like, you know... Result! How good is that? Right, let's uh, move on to the next one. Right, next up we have a jog-proof portable CD player. Annoyingly, there's quite a few of these in the pack. Not this design, a newer looking design. Quite, actually, a better product than I thought it would be. I thought it'd be very plasticky. This one is, but the other three or four look quite nice. But I've just gone through them all, and basically not one of them are playing discs. This one here, I think may be fixable. I've got the feeling with the other ones, they're just gonna need new disc drives on them. Realistically, I think the price of the disc drives will probably be similar to the price that you can buy these used on eBay, so I probably won't be fixing them. But if you have a look here, look at this. Right, so we're gonna put it in. I've got batteries in it, and, uh, have I got batteries? Yeah, I've got batteries in it. When I go to play, it says 60 seconds, and, I think I can hear it spinning. 
but nothing's happening. It doesn't change from it doesn't change from here. I'm not sure after a while if it comes up with ERR for error. But look, if I open it quickly, it's not spinning. And listen to this. Listen. Can you hear? That's not free at all. Yeah. And I think I may know what might be wrong with it. Look at this bit here. This bit, let me zoom in. This bit here is kind of like sprung loaded a bit, but this bit's just straight down. I think that that needs to be a little bit higher because look, it's lopsided, yeah? That's lopsided here, which means that when we put this in, it's gonna be dropping here and not here. So here we have a nice gap. Here, we will do now because it's uh, gravity, but look, it's dropped here. So I think we need to take it apart. We need to find out why this size dropped. I think it needs to be here. And I reckon that's the reason it's not spinning up because of friction on here. So it can't get to the required speed to do the reading. So let's take it apart and see if we can find out what's going on with that. Right, I'm not sure if there's more hidden screws underneath there. Let's open this up. Is there anything in here? Yeah, we've got a screw here. Do the same. Screw there. And I think that's it. So it might be quite easy to take apart, I wonder. That's what's nice sometimes with cheap products, because they're kind of cheaply made, they're definitely easier to take apart. Whoa. Right, here we go. So now, oh look, we're missing a rubber grommet. Where have you gone? How can you be missing? What? It's not in here. That's not gonna be able to fall. Oh yeah, maybe it fell out here. No, it, it wouldn't get through there. That's what the problem is. We're missing a rubber grommet here. There's nowhere to be seen. Ah, oh, that's annoying. Hmm. Now maybe I could take one out of the other ones, but they, they're a different design. I wonder, do they also have rubber grommets? Let me, uh, let me get them. I might be able to look down in the cracks to see. Let me pick one. Right, all the others are in really good condition, apart from this one, which is disgusting. This has got nail varnish and stuff, lipstick and marks all over it. So let's have a look, and, and it still doesn't work. I wonder whether this one would have rubber grommets in, or is it a different design? Can't actually see from here. Do you know what? The spindles and stuff look the same. You know, the, uh, the design of it, this kind of, uh, you know, L-shaped thing looks the same. So maybe, it's going to be the same on the inside. They might have just redesigned it. What I might do is I might, you know, I might look at these. And for example, if we get this one working, then I can swap this laser into each of these. If they all start working, we know it's a laser problem. And then I can price them up because maybe from China, maybe you can get them for a couple of pound each. Right, no screws on the top of that one. One more here. Yay, we've got rubber grommets. Fantastic, right, let's take one of these. Pop it in here and see if it works. I'm gonna say yes. Yep, they're the same. And they look to be the same lasers. White, blue, brown, white, blue, brown, brown, uh, red, black, brown, red, black. So they look to be the same. And we've got the ribbon cable there. Ah, uh, ribbon cable's different though. Well, maybe not, it's tucked behind there, I don't know. We can worry about that later anyway. Right, let's put this back together and see if you are now gonna start working.
Right, let's see if the disc wants to spin nicer in here now. So, I'll, take, I'll leave the batteries out for the moment. There we go, look at that. Remember the grating before? Excellent. Let's see now if it's going to recognise the disc. Turn it on. 60 seconds. There you go. Yeah, it came up with 11. And now it's playing. Apparently. God, that was quick. Super quick. Let me have a little listen. No way we've got it. Result. Let me skip. Yeah. Right, you're not going to... Well, I'll tell you what, you will be able to hear it, because what I'll do is I'll put it on here, but I'll only be able to play it for a second. Let me get a, uh, an audio jack. There we go. Check it out. Now, it's Coldplay. I can't play that. I'll instantly be uh, copyrighted. But it's not about playing music. You could see that it didn't work before with the grating, and now it works. Yeah. Result. Let's just go right the way to number 11. That's the last one. Fantastic. Right, what a fantastic start to the video. Four items, definitely faulty. Four items, definitely fixed now. This one here, not 100% sure about because that voltage regulator may drain the batteries down over time. I'm not too sure. Initially, it seems to be working, but obviously that would need more testing. So money-wise so far, this big clock here is only $14.99. I actually thought that might be a little bit more. The little clock is $7.99. Let me have a look what these two things cost. This CD player here is $15.99. I actually thought that might be a bit cheaper given the price of the others. And look, it says here 22 people have ordered it in the last 24 hours. So if that's to be believed, these items are probably actually quite popular. Now, what about that little radio? Unbelievably, that radio there is £20. And again, it says here 14 ordered in the last 24 hours. So I love it when you get current items. So that's 59 pound, isn't it? Because we had, uh, what was that? 15 plus eight is 23, 33, 43, 53, 59. Yeah, 59 pound for all that, give or take a few pennies. So you can see if you wanted to buy them new, then you've already made your money back on the whole job lot there. The problem is these are not new, they're used, but those two definitely look brand new. Radio definitely doesn't look new. That CD player looks pretty new, I think. So uh, yeah, I don't know what it would be worth to sell them second hand. You might be lucky, would you get half price for each? So £3.50 for that, £8 for that, £10 for that, £8 for that. You might get half, in which case then there's probably roughly gonna be about £30 here. If you were to take your time into it, no, of course it doesn't work, but for me, it's been thoroughly enjoyable. And I think it's been, I don't know, I think it's been an interesting video anyway. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna keep working on now, doing uh, more of these, but I'm gonna cut this video here because I think over four items, it's probably long enough as it is. So if you enjoyed it, give it a massive thumbs up. Please subscribe for the next part of this video. I'll get it released very, very soon. And hopefully, you never know, we might get maybe 80% of those items working, which would be fantastic. So uh, yeah, there we go. Thanks so much for watching. something new whatever it was that held me back i'm sure it wasn't true holding on too long and unresolved questions hold you down what could have been a friendly smile has turned into a frown i'm moving on